Six. No, seven. Hey, it's cold out there. Okay, uh, today what I want to do, I'll pick up, of course, where I left off in the topic, but I've posted, you know, Project Zero was to download and style, install and, and run CSparse from MATLAB. Uh, apparently, some of you have problems with running MATLAB on the uh, PC or getting it to compile, getting the code to compile. But I'll, I'll if you want to walk with me, I'm going to go with LA afterwards, after, just after class, and go to see what I can find out. You're welcome to walk with me if you want to see what's going on there. Uh, so, and I've also posted now Project One. It's due in a week and a half, and. Uh, the problem, it's, I think it's problem 2.2 and 2.8. It's posted on my web page. Let's see. It's uh, to write a function csfind that converts a csparse matrix into triplet form, kind of like the find function in MATLAB. So you can do this in MATLAB. You give it a sparse matrix, and it gives you a list of the row indices, column indices, and numerical values. This is the triplet form, in other words, just as three different vectors. Okay, so you're going to write a function that's going to do the same thing, uh, but with uh, your own function, CS underscore find. So this is going to be, um, you're going to have a MATLAB interface, a CS called a MEX function. I'll show you some examples of that. And then the actual code. The code itself is very simple, right? I mean, if you've got a compressed column form, you've got the row indices AI, AX, and the column pointers AP. All you got to do is for every column, you just got to go through the columns and just create the column indices and return the result. Okay. One thing you have to know, though, that in MATLAB there are no integer arrays. Well, there are integer arrays, but we're not using them. So these are actually double precision arrays storing integers. That's how MATLAB usually does it. Okay. MATLAB, they, they have a nickname for this. It's called a flint, a floating point integer. <laughs> Integer stored as a floating point value. And it's perfectly safe. A, a double precision value can store, what, 52 or 53 bits of mantissa. So it can store up to numbers up to like plus or minus 2 to the 52 uh, integers just fine, So, which is plenty big enough. And then you'll be writing uh, the opposite. So I already have a function in MATLAB uh, in CSparse. What's it called? I think it's called uh, CSSparse. And then problem 2.8, that um, <clears throat> no, wait a minute, 2. Dot, well, it's it's. Uh, let me just look this up. Um, yeah, so this function is going to actually end up creating a, uh, okay, well, actually my, my, my problem statement on the, pro on, the, on the project is slightly different than 2.8, so maybe I should just remove the notion that it's related to problem 2.8, but basically what you're doing is the opposite of this, okay? You're taking... Uh, a set of row indices, a set of column indices, a, a, a set of numerical values, and then the row and column dimension. You're taking all of this and you're going op the opposite. You're converting that into a sparse matrix A. So you're doing what I'm going to what I explained briefly last class, but using a different method. And the method you're going to use is you're going to take these three vectors on input. You're going to copy them into a a, a a k by three ar ar array stored by row. So these are, this would be an array of, of uh, a struct array you'd have to create uh, to call qsort. If you've ever used the qsort function in C, um, the idea is, is it can sort records of arbitrary size. You have to give it a compare function. And uh, you have to tell how big these records are. These records then would be, however, you know, say four bytes, four bytes, and eight bytes. So that it'd be 16 bytes total if you have a 32-bit MATLAB. It, it won't, QSort won't work on this because there's, there, there are three different arrays. QSort has to work on one uh, array where every object is one item. So this gets sorted, and then you can copy this to, then you can go from here, find out where the columns start and finish, 
and then uh, throw away the column indices and uh, go to this data structure over here. Okay, so you create, you don't, you're not going to return this data structure. It's awkward. You're not going to overwrite your input. That's bad. Don't try to do that in MATLAB, by the way. Never change your input arguments. You'll crash MATLAB horribly if you do that. So you take these three vectors on input. You create this workspace. So you sort it. And then you create another data structure, this, the C-sparse data structure, and populate it with these values and create the column pointers based on where the columns start. Okay. So that's the, those are the two projects going this way and that way, back and forth again. Okay, this is a different approach than what's in the book. This, if you have k non-zeros, the time taken here is order uh, probably m plus n plus k log k. Uh, it's probably not order m, actually. The time complexity for this so the code that you're writing should be n plus k log k. The time complexity for the code that I'm going to talk about today and I left off talking about last class is different. It would be, oh, let's see, what would it be? I believe it would be order, let's see, order m plus n plus k. Yes. And the space complexity here would also be, uh, the space complexity here would be order n plus k space. The space complexity for my code that does this is proportional to uh, this. It's the same. So the time and space for my algorithm is this. Now, um, can you see the pros and cons of these different methods? Looking at the asymptotic complexity, when would you want to use one versus the other? Anybody? Can you use that one when m is large? Yeah, yeah, if m is enormous, right? I mean, what if you had a, a billion by one sparse vector? n is one. You've got five non zeros in it. I mean, people actually do this. They, they use a sparse vector kind of as a cheap lookup table, as a hash table. The, the, bio, the biological or biometric or something, bioinformatics toolbox in MATLAB does this. Okay. And uh, I wrote, for the MathWorks, I wrote an algorithm that does this, uh, but they're not using it. And the reason they're not using it because they didn't tell me this was a problem. I thought, no, no big deal, right? When you're de developing a, a sparse linear system, usually m usually have one non-zero per row and column, at least. So m is much less than k. So who cares if it's m plus n plus k? This is order k, essentially, in practice. If, you have, if every row and column has at least one non-zero in it, then it's just k, order k non-zeros. So this is fine, right? Well, that is a, that's a that's an assumption. What if that assumption doesn't hold? Then I've got an M in there, and M can dominate this time. Most matrices that come from linear systems, this is larger than this over here. So for say, if you're solving a finite element problem or whatever, this can be in practice ten times faster, and it, it's been shown to be up that up to ten times faster than this method over here. But this method over here will work on that billion by one uh, vector that this biometric or the bioinformatic toolbox uses. And it won't run out of memory either. But I'll run out of memory because I require an order billion workspace. So, you know, there's trade-offs. And I didn't think about that when I, when I was designing uh, this algorithm. And really what, what should happen, there should be a meta-algorithm that should pick between the two methods depending on M. If M is enormous, well, don't pick that method. Pick this method. Okay. Because there's no dependency on M here. The row index, you, it's irrelevant. You just sort by column by row index, and you go through all the entries, and you find 
the, where the columns start and stop, so you have space of size n and time thus of size n to construct that column pointer, there's no dependency on m, the number of rows of the matrix, at all. It's just data. But over here, the, the method I'm going to talk about today has does have this dependency. So uh, in terms of the, let me, let me show you here uh, what you'll be doing with, uh, uh, with the code. If you look, if you look at my, if you, if you look at this, the, the, the web page for the book, okay, whoops, wrong one. No, that's not the right one. If you look at, uh, yeah, if you look at this, this page for the book, if you come down here, I've got a, a list by chapter of all the source codes, okay. At the very end, I've got a discussion of sparse matrices in MATLAB, and each of these in this list, I know that's too small to see on the screen. Um, maybe I'll make that bigger. Then uh, every function has a MATLAB uh, M file and a C file. The M file, and this, let me look at the, this is the GAXBM, okay. This is a MATLAB file, but it doesn't do anything. It just gives you the function header. This is the doing the, the Gaxby function, the A times X plus Y, okay? And then it gives you help information. So if I had MATLAB running and I typed help CS Gaxby, it would uh, tell me that it was a novel written in the early 1900s. No, that's a different Gaxby. Um, this is this is greater than that Gatsby, right? No, <laughs> it would give you this information right here, it, and uh, then if you tried to run the code, it would then try to execute. If, if it didn't see the compiled MEX function, the C code, it would say it would try to run the MATLAB M dot M file, and it would say, well, it's not compiled yet. So this is just a, this this statement here is just a, a, a an error check to say, hey, you haven't compiled the code yet. But this is the actual code right here. This is. Every every uh, function that uh, and is that big enough on the screen there? Every function that written in C that MATLAB calls has one name, max function. Every function has that name. Okay. It just is going to go in a, in, a, in a file of a certain name that's then known to MATLAB, but in, it knows where it. it this is like void main in it for a main program in C. Okay, void max function. You always have to call it that, and it always has the same inputs and outputs. The number of input arguments, array of pointers to. I'm sorry, the number of output arguments. I told you I'm dyslexic. I get in and out, left, right, up, down. Up, down. I don't get mixed up, but anyway, it's got an array of mx a po array of pointers to mx arrays. Mx array is a MATLAB array, which is really can be anything. It could be a sparse matrix. It could be a, an, an object. It could be a struct, a MATLAB struct. It could be a cell array. It could be all kinds of different things in MATLAB. These are the, these are the pointers to the output arguments that you have to populate. Okay. So for instance, if this function is called this way, narg out would be one because it's got one output argument, and you'd be presented here on input with an empty with an array of size one. That would say, hey, this is empty, and when you're done, you got to fill me up. Okay, and then narg in would be three, and the uh, you'd be given three input arguments, and then valid pointers that you could you could look at. The first thing I do is then check to see, hey, if narg out is bigger than one, or if narg out is not equal to narg in is not three, then you generated then I create an error message, and, I, and the function terminates. This is C code I'm looking at, and the error, there's a max MATLAB function called max error message text with a string, and it kicks out back. Okay, um, narg out can be zero. So, and the idea there is that if you in MATLAB just type this command in by itself, there's one output argument that gets copied to the MATLAB variable ants, not a n t s, not a u n t s like ants and uncles, but ants is in short for answer. So narg out can be zero, then it just gets copied to that variable ans. 
So that's our narg out of zero is not an error. But if it's more than one, that means you're asking for more from the function that it can provide. So you've used it incorrectly. So you generate an error. Then what I do um, is I have three, uh, ca four calls here. I can't count. Um, in which I get the three input arguments and I create space for the third for the for the output argument. Okay. These anything that starts with CS in the codes that you see will be my codes. So CS max get sparse and put double. Uh, you'll be using those get double get double put double get sparse. Okay. Uh, you'll be using those. You'll probably be using put int as well, which puts an integer, but it does the the com the conversion to flint for you. Okay. These functions I wrote, and you can find them in um, the what's called this the this is the file cs underscore mex dot c. These are all my various utility files. I have things like cs mex check that checks a matrix. You know, if it has to have a certain number of elements or a certain dimension, is it should it be should it be square? Yeah, I haven't used you haven't seen me use this yet. Should it be sparse? Should it have values and whatnot? Okay, and so I have various checks to to say, well, hey, it's got to be, you know, is it of the right to the wrong dimension and so on and so forth. Okay, that Gaxby function doesn't use that. Um, maybe it should. I forget. Maybe, do I? Um, we'll see some error checks here. I get this A matrix, and that gives me the row and column dimension here, AM and AN. And I think I assert in this function here that x has to be of dimension n, has to be a vector of length n. Then anyway, so back to the CS max. So I don't using the CS check. Now this is this is a function called this is the CS max get sparse function. Um, and I pass in some parameters here, the matrix that I'm wanting to populate. Uh, whether I, I tell it whether it should be square, whether it should have values uh, copied over, or whether it's going I'm going to ignore the values. And this is the input, which is the MATLAB version of the sparse matrix. And all I do is first I do the max check. I say, hey, is it square or not? Does it have, you know, does it have values present? And then I uh, I call some. See, MATLAB has the same data structure as I use for C sparse, more or less. <coughs> Okay, it has the column, has a row dimension, column dimension, M and N, respectively. The column pointers AP, what I call AP, the P array, the I and the X array. Now, MATLAB does not let you get direct access to that data structure. It only allows you to um, have access via functions that all start with the name MX. So if you look at MATLAB and you do you look at the documentation, you search for MX get M, for instance. And if I had MATLAB up and running, I would I could do that for you. It would talk to you, to tell you about how this what this C code does. Okay. All it does is you pass it a matrix and it returns to the number of rows. Uh, they what what I call the P vector, they call J C for J for column. Uh, right. Uh, would, J is typically used for column indices. I for row, J for column. And C for column, I don't know where they got J, C, column, I don't know where they got that. But that's what they call it. And I, R is the I for row and R for row. All for, and, one for, and one for all, I guess. Hurrah, hurrah. Anyway, that's what they call that. And then get PR means pointer to real. And you're not going to worry about imaginary uh, matrices in, in this course. If, on the other hand, you, run a, you are running on a 64-bit MATLAB, the code you see in front of you on the screen here will look different because I'll actually will handle the complex case. But your code doesn't have to. Because CX X stands for extended. It's extended in two ways, the CX sparse code. One, it can handle kind of a complex case. And two, it can run with either ints or longs or ints or on Windows int 64T. Which is a 60, in other words, a 60, it, it can be, it can run on a 64-bit MATLAB. Now, whether or not you need to use a 32-bit or 64-bit depends on what version of MATLAB you have, not what your code, not what your machine is. So 
So if you have a 32-bit MATLAB running on a 64-bit machine, you need to run C sparse. Well, you, in either case, you could run CX sparse. It'll run on both. But it, you can stick with the slightly simpler C sparse, which is printed in the book verbatim, uh, if you have a 32-bit MATLAB. Uh, then there's uh, NZ Max as well. It's the same same thing. And then I have another flag ANZ, which I set to minus one, which denotes a compressed column matrix. So I just populate one at a time all those different pieces of the matrix. Put sparse does the opposite. There's an MX set. Um, you're going to have to call this function, and uh, it'll do. All, it, there's a bunch of gnarly stuff in here, and you should be very happy that I'm doing this for you, okay? Because some of it's really nasty, um, and uh, some of it's a little bit, uh, I mean, this is really ugly, actually. This is not necessarily necessary, but some of the people at the MathWorks think it is, so I put it in there. It's optional, I think. To, anyway, don't try to parse what this is doing. Just trust it. If something breaks, you'll quickly get a seg fault, by the way, in MATLAB, and it, but it won't be from this. Seg faults are very. If you if you the first the first thing that will happen when you try to run your own code is a seg fault. Trust me, because you'll mess up some pointer. And MATLAB is very intolerant of that. That that's why when you run MATLAB, uh, it's when it's when a seg fault occurs quite often. Say if it's really nasty, what can happen is the entire MATLAB window just disappears. You're toast. So what is uh, ha what is handy, especially on on Unix land. Linux land is here, this thing here. If you're running on, say, Thunder, or if you're logging in remotely, use the capital X, capital Y option on SSH, and then run MATLAB dash no desktop. Then you just stay in the command line window. And so if you have something nasty happens, you'll see you know, the window won't just be destroyed because it's not a MATLAB window, it's just your command line window. So that can be helpful, especially if you're on a, also if you're on a slow connection. You don't want to use the whole camera is like <laughs> you don't want to use the whole uh, the whole window I'm, I'm using only now part of the window I'm using this part right from here to about I'm just using you know this 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 window <laughs> all right it's weird watching myself on the screen over there okay um, MX get double is very simple it just gets the pointer to the real and returns it. But there's the check. So this is going to tell me if I try to do A times X, where A is 2 by 2 and X is a billion by 1, it'll say, blah. Well, it won't say that. It'll say something else, but it'll choke. Put double does a similar thing. You notice I actually have to do a copy here. Uh, this is this is get a get flint. OK, the flint array in MATLAB is a real, you notice this is double star P. This is the double pointer. I get the MATLAB code, and I do several things. I check, the, or find a maximum entry, because sometimes it, there, 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 there's an upper and lower bound I want to check. Uh, I get the thing, and I... Let's see, I subtract one, convert to int. I thought I did that through a test. Uh, um, I guess I thought I had an option to turn this on or off, but I guess I don't. What's happening here is if I'm getting a flint array, that's always the case I'm getting an array of indices. And you'll see this happen quite frequently there'll be a subtraction by one. Now, when you create a sparse matrix, you don't have to do that. The reason this has to happen is suppose, suppose you write a code and you want to pass in a sparse matrix A and you want to pass in row, a row index one. And you say, do something to row one of this matrix. So you pass a one, because that's what MATLAB thinks is the first row of at the MATLAB level. But underneath, everything is zero-based. So MATLAB is constantly translating for one-based indexing at the top to zero-based indexing at the bottom. So the very first thing I do if I get a flint array is I subtract one from it. 
and um, you will you will want to uh, exploit. Well, you 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 may wish to exploit that. You don't have to, okay? Because you're going to make a copy of this anyway. This CS get flint is making a copy of the input, which and converting it to integer for you and subtracting by one, which is what you need to do here. But you're, that would make yet another copy, which then you have to put over here. So it would make more sense if you just get the double and do the do the conversion and copy to and subtraction of minus one yourself here. And if you want to save the subtraction from minus one until you copy over to this data structure, you're welcome to it. However, you've got to know that these row indices here differ by one from these row indices. You have to subtract one. These row indices go from one to M. These, by the time you finish the matrix, those will go from zero to M minus one. It's very easy to make a mistake. And so um, I have something that can help you. I have a solution. There's a question in the back of the book in, in section two, chapter two that says, write a max function which checks a MATLAB sparse matrix for errors. What kind of errors can in there be? All sorts of different errors. Well, I, I solved that one because people had so many problems doing this sort of thing. Um, there's something called I wrote called Spock, sparse for short for sparse OK. There, <laughs> there's it's on MATLAB Central. It's also on my web page, but it doesn't have the cool picture. Um, it checks logically if the sparse matrix is OK. So if you create a sparse matrix from an M file, it'll be OK. But if you create one inside a MEX function, all sorts of things could be broken. Row indices could be out of range. Column pointers could be invalid. Right? The column pointers, you can't have a column with negative three entries in it. Right? Think about it. That doesn't make any sense, right? Well, that could happen if you have these these column pointers say, well, hey, column one, column zero starts here. Column zero must always start at position zero. That's a, that's something I check. Column one starts at negative three. Oops, no, it has to start. In other words, the column pointers have to be monotonically increased, non-decreasing. They can they can be flat because you have no entries in a column, but they can't decrease. That would mean you have got a negative number of entries. They can't go backwards. But it's very easy to create such a list of integers that's then mangled. It's all kinds of things that can happen. And um, so the idea here is once you create a sparse matrix on output, call Spock on it. Download this code, run it, I mean compile it, and then use it to check your output. And if it tells you, you know, MATLAB may look at the matrix and say, well, it can't tell. There could be a duplicate entry, for example, in it. Spock will find that. MATLAB will not. Okay. Um, and there's one comment in rating on here. The guy says, hey, I want to do this in Fortran. Oh, please. Go away. <laughs> I do not do Fortran. I do not speak Fortran. I speak C. All right, so um, so use Spock. It will help you. He will help you. Um, what else? Algorithmically, this is not a difficult assignment. Okay, conceptually, it's not difficult. Your difficulty will be in implementation and getting your pointers not to dangle somewhere. Getting it MATLAB to call your code, not getting a seg fault. There'll be, you'll have lots of errors like that. Okay. Once you get over that hump, the next project, those you, you'll have that down cold. Well, maybe it'll be warmer by then in mid-January. I don't know. But you will, um, you'll hopefully be better off. So you're starting, starting off with a conceptually simple problem uh, at first. So. So that's project one. And I think that's. How are we going to turn this in? Oh, to turn it in, um, I'm going to see about using uh, the e learning site, the Sakai or whatever it's called. Um, so if you go to. And, you know, you should, you should, you should have, uh, you should have access to it. 
to the Sakai, Sakai e-learning site, whatever it is. Um, there's a link here to e-learning. and So you just log in here. You type in. Now, nobody look. I'm typing my password in. My password is dot, 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 dot. Okay, so don't rem don't write that down. Uh, and uh, let's see. So so I think this has a way of of handling uh, submission of assignments, which I've not figured out yet. But I believe this is the where the place that we will do it. So watch this space. And when I figure this, how to, this is the first time I've used this setup. But um, this is probably what we'll use to, uh, to do the submission. Anyway, so there's the get int. There's also a put int, which does a copy. And you notice here on put int, I don't know if you can see it on the screen down below if it's too small. The put int uh, has an option of an offset. It can say, um, yeah, offset the thing, add one in the words, or not, depending on like for, I may be returning a row and a list of row indices, but from f in C land it's from it's, they start at zero, it's zero based indexing, but in MATLAB land it's one based. So I pass in an offset of one to do that, that increment. So these are just some helpful. Uh, Routines, just a few of them here, to get and put double precision arrays, real integer, or integer arrays, sparse arrays, to put them and get them to and from MATLAB. And uh, they they make the MEX function here a lot simpler. So, so your code will look like that. So let me let me now um, go to then the CS. Compress. Let me let me do one thing here too while I'm at it. Um, shoot, I lost my. Here we go. Uh, the CS compress. Oh, there's my face. You don't need to see my face. The CS compress function was the thing I was talking about today. So let me go down here and show you its. Oh, I guess I don't have a direct interface for it. What do I have instead? Um, CS sparse. Convert a triple form into a sparse matrix. So you might want to take a look at this right here. This is my MEX function that, this is my MEX function for doing this. Okay? So your MEX function will mimic this. So start with this. That's fine. I mean, you know, it gets a triplet matrix. You just have a different set of functions in here. You will instead, at this point, call your own code. Okay, but getting the inputs and stuffing the outputs, it'll all be the same. All right, so you'll just have a different algorithm in here um, to, to, to do this conversion. This algorithm is doing extra stuff, which you do not have to do. You do not have to worry about duplicate entries. You do not have to worry about hard zeros. Remember that I say, oh, 3 minus 3 is non-zero, right? Well, that's not that's false in MATLAB. 3 minus 3 gets computed, and it gets put in there as a zero. But the moment you re then return that matrix to MATLAB, you better delete that entry from the matrix. Because MATLAB has an assertion that says, we don't do that. OK, so there's pros and cons about that decision. It breaks all the theory, but anyway, whatever. Uh, but what's theory? I mean, you know, the, who is it that said? I think it was Yogi Berra. You said, uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So you you can just mimic this, and except that what you'll do is a very different algorithm than what, it, what I've got. So now you, you come down here and you see this call to CS compress of T. So I'm going to take 
a triplet form matrix and convert it into a compressed sparse column matrix. So I call it CS compress. But then I call CS duple, which gets rid of duplicates. And then I call CS drop zeros, which drops the zeros. And then I pass the result. Oh, then I do a transpose. Huh? You'll see why. You'll see why in a minute. That does the sort for me. That sorts the row indices I tra by transposing the matrix. I create a compressed row form, actually, for C. Because here, I, I get, I cheat. It's really easy to transpose a triplet form matrix. You just swap the row and column indices. OK? So here, when I'm getting the column indices, I'm actually ask, I actually get the row indices, and I put them for the column indices. And I take the column indices, and I put them for the row indices. I convert this matrix now to compressed sparse column form, but now I'm doing this on the transpose. So I need to transpose the result to get the answer. The reason I do that is the transpose naturally acts as a bucket sort. I'll explain that when we get there. You don't have to do this. And in fact, if you, if you don't fix this, you will get the wrong matrix back. So be careful when you're doing the CS max get int. This is in opposite order, column and row, for argument zero, argument one. But this should be row and column in your code. So you'll have to swap this right here. Be careful with that. Um, so you have this transpose here, which you will not do. All right. It's that transpose and such that that adds this extra m time. OK, so now how do we take, so there, there's all this sort of me mechanics, right? This wrapper of all this extra MATLAB garbage. I mean, the getting, into, getting from MATLAB all the way now down into the C code. So let's look at now at the C code where the real algorithm lives. OK, and that is this C sparse, uh, CS compress Function. So this is what I want to talk about algorithmically now. I'm still showing you code, but now there's nothing, there's no MATLAB here. Now, this, by the way, is a very useful way of designing code that's to be used in MATLAB. You have a MEX function interface, which is, has all this MATLAB-specific stuff in it. MX get PR, MX, yeah, all these calls to MATLAB functions. But the numeric, the computational engine, the numerical work, the actual work that's done is done in over here in codes like this, which have nothing to do with MATLAB at all. They're completely independent from MATLAB. So you can call this from a standalone C code that doesn't know that MATLAB exists, which is kind of handy. So this is its own API, which is a very simple one. It's a standalone, standalone code that can be called directly from C. That's not strictly necessary. It's just a good idea because it makes the code more usable. So there's lots of people who use this code package, CSparse, that don't use MATLAB. So it just extends the use of the code to a broader world. So how does this algorithm work? Well, um, I first check to make sure I've got a triplet matrix. OK, then I extract the contents. OK, you notice here, I get the column indices as the TP array. OK. Uh, then, and again, the font size might be too small. I mean, in in really, this font size I'm using for these slides is too small. I mean, you might be able to see it from the back. Can you see it from the back of the class? OK. It's, it's smaller than I like to use for slides. OK. But you have the book in front of you normally, right? No. You have the code online. You have the slides online. So if you're watching this after the fact, if those of you who are not here, hello. Uh, you know, you can look at the code. You can look at the slides. Um, the handy thing is I can put the whole code on, this, on one slide. Most of the codes, by the way, are like that. They all fit on a slide like this. So it's very modular code. Uh, most of the codes fit on a page of the book, which is like, this is like half a page. There's one code that goes to seven pages long. Sorry. But the other ones are, are usually just a page. Um, anyway, so the, the first thing I do is I spalloc. So this is a sparse allocate. I allocate a compressed sparse matrix uh, that's m by n with nz non-zeros, which comes from here. And it allocates the, the double precision part only if 
the triplet form has the double precision part, and I forget what the zero is. Probably tells me that I'm creating a compressed column form matrix, not a triplet form. I think that's what that is. Then I calic an array of size n integers. So calic uh, initializes the array to all zero. Then I check to see, did I really succeed to allocate that space? And if I do not succeed, I have this helper function called csdone, which I call down here as well. What csdone, and have like two or three versions of this, csdone is going to return a pointer to the first input argument, c. This case, though, it's going to free the thing and return null because I, I pass a zero for failure. Here I pass one for success, and here I do not free my input, but I return my input to the output so I can just return with call done, and it saves me some lines of code, makes it nice and clean. So this is my error handling right here. And what CS done does is it frees these two workspaces. It frees this workspace W, and it frees the workspace, oh, well, I don't need to use it, so I pass in null. But other codes will have two workspaces. And if that, so, it would free that. So then, so all this up to this point is all sort of grunt work, right? And then I extract it out the CP, the CI, the CX array, and so forth. Finally, okay, one, two, three, four, five lines of code does the actual algorithm. And as a helper function, I have a function called cumsum, which is, I think is on the next uh, two slides. So what has to happen here to take a triplet form, okay, so with row, column, row and column indices. Now, it's all zero-based now, so this, we're not talking about MATLAB anymore. We've got a list of row indices, a list of column indices, and a list of numerical values. And what I want to do is I want to now write the columns like this. They're of different sizes. Okay, here's column zero, column one, column two, and so forth. Okay, the first thing I needed to find out is how big each of these columns are. How many non-zeros are in each column? So that's this one liner right here. I go through all the non-zeros. I get the column index of an entry, tj of k, and I increment w at that position. So now w, if I have, say, five entries here, and ten entries here, and three here, and seven here, and, and, and that's about four, okay? Then by the time I'm done, then the W array will contain these, these numbers, five, ten, three, seven, four, and so forth, okay? Because it started out as zero. It was calic. It was initialized to zero. Now I'm doing this. So, so far, there's no magic. Now there's a bit of a magic in here, and what the CP or what this cumsum function is doing is doing two things. It's creating the column pointer CP, which is going to start at zero, okay? But this entry here is the sum of the previous CP plus five. So this is five. This is then 15 because it's this plus this to get 15. This entry is 18. This is 25. This is 29 and so forth. And if the matrix had five columns, that would what would be, in fact, let's suppose I have a matrix with five columns. That's what the CP array would, array would be. It's of size six, n plus one. And the last entry would be 29, which is the sum of these five numbers. So 29 is the number of non-zeros. Ignoring duplicates, ignoring zeros, and all, hard zeros, and so forth. CP of zero is always zero. If you make this different than zero, you will crash MATLAB pathetically. Do not do so. Spock will find it and say, ah, can't do that. The other thing that happens in this cumsum function, it's a very simple function, is it overwrites W with these values here. So it, it overwrites W with 5, 15, 18, 20 and 25, no, 5, 15, 18, 25, and 29. No, it doesn't do that. That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. It overwrites, it, it does this. That's my five-minute warning. 
So it does this, 0, 5, 15, 18, and 25. Okay. So now I go through all the non-zeros, and I, I look at a non-zero, okay, and I get its column index, tj of k. So if, if I spell this out, I have, this is ti, tj, and tx. j equals tj of k. So I get the j, tj. Uh, and then I... I take that and I assign it to P. So in other words, I, I get, so suppose J is equal to one. What that means is I have an entry to put in column one. And at the moment, W of one points here. It points to five, the fifth entry, which is the first unoccupied slot of this column. So I get this pointer P and I increment, I post increment W here. And so this is where I'm gonna put my entry. So P equals W of J plus plus. So I do the post increment on, on W. I assign that to P, and then I use that to stick the row index into T, I of K. So the row index goes at that position in the I array. And in the X array, if I'm using it, is also where the X array, the, the numerical value goes. So I'm just filling these columns one entry at a time. So if the next entry might be in, columns, in, in column uh, four. Then I go here. And I have a pointer here, and I put the entry here, and I increment the pointer. So this, this W array is incrementing, and when it's done, it'll, it'll, it'll be shifted. It'll be, it'll be uh, uh, 5, 15, and 18, and so forth, because every entry will point to the end of the, each column. And that's it. So I have, um, you know, it's not even 920, and people are opening the door. I don't get it. I mean, I, don't, I should put a little sign, please, class in session. I'm going to ask the next class if they would please kindly do that because uh, it's very distracting to have the door opening while I'm lecturing. And anyway, that's the algorithm. So we're just taking each of these entries and stuffing them one at a time in the columns. All right. Now, uh, so it's, if you will, a bucket sort. I'm sorting the entries by column, which is what I need. But the entries within each column are not sorted by row index at all. They're just whatever they appear here. So if this is out of order here, this will be out of order here. Now in your project, what's going to be very important to do is you're going to, to start with this, to, to, to test this, you're going to start with a sparse matrix A. You can do the find on this, i, j, and x equals find of A. Okay. And then what I would recommend doing is create a random permutation vector. Say P equals randperm uh, NNZ of A. Okay, and then do the following. Do I equals I of P. J equals J of P. X equals X of P. And then if you do the following, C equals sparse. This is all using MATLAB, none of your code. I, J of X. Mn, where Mn, Mn equals size of A. So if you do this, you've just deconstructed a compressed sparse column matrix into its triplet form. You've jumbled up the triplet forms, and then you've packed it back again. And now if you do A minus C, you'll get a zero matrix. So you've reconstructed a copy of the matrix. So do this first, then rip this out, and put your code in in place. This is how you'll test your code. And to test the code with matrices, you can create your own, or you can use something uh, in the C sparse package called ufget, which is a MATLAB interface to the sparse matrix uh, collection that I have. It'll download a sparse, sparse matrix from a real problem and pick small ones. And I'll show you next class how to use ufget. It's very simple to use. You don't want to use a billion by billion. I don't have the matrices that are that big. You don't want to use the biggest matrices. They won't fit. Use very, you know, use the small ones. Uh, and if you run the demo for CSparse, it'll download about 100 or 200 of these small matrices already for you. You'll see a bunch of them sp splat up on your screen with all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And uh, you can use those. They'll already be downloaded. 
So that's the compressed function, and I'll, I'll talk about um, then more stuff to do with these basic data structures, basic utility type functions like this on Monday. Also, right after class, I'm going to, LA had a question about not compiling well on Windows in 2000, MATLAB 2010 on the CSE machines. I'm going to walk over there and look at that right now. So if anybody wants to walk with us, we could, you know, accommodate a few extra people. So with that, I will see you Monday. Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. Right. Oh, and I have to shift office hours a little bit today. I have a doctor's appointment at 1045. So, but I'll be around this afternoon, and the TA will be around 